Thank you all for being here. I'm glad to see people in the theater, and I'm happy to be in the theater with all of you. You're in for a treat today. Um, this film grabbed my attention because of its unique qualities in terms of putting together a science story and feeding us facts, but in a very entertaining way. And um, I think that it maybe will help us to learn a little bit more than we might otherwise. But I'd also like to thank uh, the Jim Voice Trust and Chris Otis for seeing the importance and value in this film and their sponsorship. But enjoy the film. Stick around afterwards. Niobe Thompson, the director, will be here to answer all of our questions. Thank you. Talk about a great home movie to have for your family after that. I'd like to ask Niobe Thompson, the director, to come up and um, we can have a little fireside chat with all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Niobe. You're welcome. It's such a great film. And it's, um, it, it seems like such a crazy idea to do a whole film about one element, name of carbon. <laughs> how, how did you come up with that idea? <laughs> Um, well, the, the impetus for the film uh, came out of conversations I was having with the, my co-director, Daniela. Um, she's from Sydney, Australia, and we've known each other for years. And um, I took a year away from filmmaking, a sabbatical, a few years ago, and we were traveling around the world, and I was sort of in conversation with Daniela. And, <clears throat> and I was reading um, David Wallace Wall's, Wells' book, uh, The Uninhabitable Earth, and it was really getting me down. And so we're having a conversation about how in 2050, um, our kids could be raising families just like we are now. And you know, it's just such a dark thing to connect the dots and to realize what a lot of trouble we're in, and yet the fact that we're all raising another generation. And so we started to talk about how to make a film about the climate emergency that wasn't just a film about the climate emergency. And um, she had read Primo Levi's autobiography, it was the Holocaust survivor chemist, and he wrote a chapter in that book called The Periodic Table, called Carbon, in which carbon has um, a voice. And she put it to me, she said, you know, this would be an interesting way to go at it. Um, like, it's a completely upside down way to look at the world through the eyes of an element, and yet it really makes a lot of sense. Um, so that was a starting point. And, and we developed the story together. But it was really important for us to find the hope in this conversation. And, um, and so that's why the last 15 minutes of the film really take you to that place. Um, you know, we've, we've got a job in front of us, and there were some dark moments in the film, but I really wanted to emphasize that we, we have solutions, and we also have uh, new generations that give us a reason to fight that hard. Yeah. And, and that's, of course, why we wanted to have full audience here t to watch it today, because of the solutions. We see it's simple, and we know what to do. So how do we... And that's why I love your film, is because it's so clear, and it has such hope. How do we, how do we get those people to, <laughs> to, to <Yeah>. listen? <laughs> Well, I mean, this, this film is, is now showing all around the world, and yeah. it, it's, it's, it's part of that gargantuan effort that we, we have to make. And the other thing uh, that Daniela and I were talking about is, okay, we've got a real situation. No one can, on their own, shift the dial, but all of us have some kind of superpower. All of us have something that we do, yeah. you know, whether we're you know, a writer or a car mechanic or you know, raising kids uh, or a filmmaker. So... You know, we thought, well, the one thing we can do to try to shift the dial is to make a film about this. And so, um, you know, I think, I think uh, it gives you hope to realize that everyone has something they can bring to this. But uh, in terms of hope, um, renewables have reached a critical mass where, you know, the guy, Andy McCarthy, says, I'm not an environmentalist because this just makes business sense. Yeah. You know, we're there. It's, it's more expensive uh, to keep a coal-fired uh, power plant open than it is to create a renewable wind or solar generation facility. Um, and we also know how to take carbon out of the atmosphere. I mean, what the film doesn't say is we have to build, so that plant takes 4,000 tons of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. It's an experimental plant in Squamish up in British Columbia. 
a production facility would take a million tons of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. We need to build one production sized plant like that every week from now to 2050 wow. for those plants to take enough carbon out of the atmosphere to make up for the gap that we just can't make up if we electrify everything. Yeah. So, you know, we try to keep it light, but we've got a situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes? Um, is it available on DVD and are you a scientist too? Is it available on DVD and are you a scientist too? Um, it's, it's just starting its journey. Um, we are just going out into the world of festivals and the first broadcasts have happened outside of the U.S., but um, we're going to have a, have a distribution deal in the States, so it will all come. Uh, my personal priority is to make it as available as possible and not hide it behind paywalls and make it difficult to discover. Um, so please give us time. Um, I can tell you that if you just write me an email and say, can I share this film with my family, I'll just send you the secret link. Uh, so you can always reach out to me and I'll give you the film. Uh, now, I'm a scientist in the sense that I'm an anthropologist, so I don't know if that counts. I'm a doctor, but not the useful kind. Uh, <laughs> I, left, I left teaching um, about 13 years ago to make films, uh, just because I really wanted to work in, in um, communication, so communication of science. Come, come talk to me afterwards, I'll give it to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to say I thought the film was stunningly beautiful and fascinating. It, just, it, it was incredible to me because I think part of the attendance issue is I came to it because I'm very environmentally concerned, very concerned about my yeah. okay, I need to see this movie. But the way you presented it was so much fun. Yeah. She loves the film. It's beautiful. She's impressed with the scientists. You're environmentally concerned. And the scientists, that's another thing I wanted to say, is how did you cast this? Because they're all so incredibly on board with how with your idea for the film. Yeah, aren't they great? I mean, honestly, I, I just, I, I can't believe it when I look at those <laughs> interviews. <laughs> so there are, there are a few things that we did. Um, first of all, we had to warn the scientists, we're treating carbon as a female presence. We're asking you to, t to c talk about carbon as a she. Carbon will have a voice. And we were pretty concerned that scientists would push back against that. So we, we put that on the table before we agreed with them to do the interviews. and. I was really surprised how almost every scientist leapt on it. They really liked that approach. Um, we also asked them to share their enthusiasm. We said, you know, you're, you're all carbon nerds. We're not, so bring us your passion. And they, you know, they, they really came to it with that spirit. Um, but, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an example. So um, the, the, the cameraman who filmed him had done his last interview before the pandemic started. And then he went into his brownstone in New York, and that was it for a year and a half, right? And we reached out to him through a common friend and said, we're making this film about carbon, and we know you have a particular nerdy fascination for the element carbon. And he just had the spare time in the middle of the pandemic to write back and say, yeah, I really think carbon is neat. And he just wrote me a huge email about all the neat things to do with carbon, most of them too complex to put in the film. Um, and then, <clears throat> and then uh, he got his his first vaccination, and he went on the Today Show and said, I got my first vaccination. And so I wrote him like that hour and said, okay, so can we set the interview up? <laughs> right? so, so that was the first interview he did uh, after the pandemic. But I was sitting in a bedroom on Vancouver Island, you know, with a nice shirt and pajama pants, <laughs> doing a Zoom thing. I mean, the, the, what you don't understand is, I didn't meet any of those scientists. You know, we interviewed all of them by Zoom. Um, we really wanted this film not to look like it was made in a pandemic. But um, I, just, I just pinched myself that we were talking to those scientists through an iPad. I was an image on an iPad. We were usually in their homes. Um, everyone was in masks except for them, and yet they still brought that enthusiasm. It's just such a gift. Yes? That's great. Love, love the voice of it all. It's fantastic. And I'm kind of interested in uh, that concept of giving a character to carbon, that concept of having that dialogue. 
do you have, I mean, Mark, looking at who's been supporting it, Spring Australia and Spring Canada, and the people that are pretty good at this stuff, do you have a whole back end kind of education thing happening on that where you can continue that carbon first person voice dialogue thing? Uh, is the question, do we have a, 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 an outreach campaign um, aimed at schools and students? Yes, that kind of is question. And also the question was, why did we give carbon a voice? No, no, no I love voice. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether you have an educational program that's going to roll out that continues with, like, asking the kids at the teacher or whatever to continue in that way, because I think that's actually, you know, for people that, many people that feel saturated by the information and kind of powerless to contribute to it, it's a really interesting twist to imagine the perspective of carbon, the way it's come, the way it could go. <laughs> yeah, no, I, thanks for saying that. I guess there's a lot of other elements in the periodic table we could do this with. <laughs> That was, that was your compatriot, Sarah Snook, uh, who is the voice of Carbon uh, from Australia. You know, um, we don't have a, a campaign to ex extend this apart from bringing this as a teaching module to schools. And so we're already doing that in Australia, and we're going to do that in Canada in the next academic year, and I hope other, other countries will follow. So we've produced educational resources to go with this film. And we're kind of testing it in my own home city of Victoria um, with students in June. We've got an IMAX theater. I'm going to show this in the IMAX theater, and kids are going to come in, and I'm going to talk to kids because I want to get a sense of whether this is, is landing with a, a 14 year old. You know, I, I think it. I think it will. Yeah, and it was. We had education screenings uh, earlier in the week for the Docklands education component, and kids came in to actually see it. So it'll be interesting to get the feedback from from the education folks about how that went, yeah. But, I mean, what a way to learn science. It's so great, yeah. Was there another, yes? I was gonna ask how you and Daniela came up with uh, Carbon being a woman, or a yeah. How did they come up with the, or Carbon being a woman? Um, the, the gender thing came from her, and um, I thought it was logical. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the creator element. This is the element where if you have the right conditions of moisture and heat um, and carbon and a few other elements, life just spontaneously comes about, apparently. So the idea was that it should be a female voice uh, echoing the creator role. Um, but it's interesting. This is a film that's been translated or is being translated into many other languages. And so, so far we've learned, like we should have known this ahead of time, uh, in French, in German, uh, and in Russian, carbon is masculine. <laughs> so I was just talking to a friend of mine who lives near Paris, and they'd, they'd seen the, 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 the French transmission. It's dubbed, and it's a male voice, because to the French, French le chabon, it's ma masculine, right? Yeah, so we're running a bit of a problem with that, but uh, yeah. I'm, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. There's, there's more of us. I, I wanted to ask, if you learned anything surprising, was there any thing that stands out in your mind that you learned through making the film that surprised you? Well, we, we, we really, I had to learn a lot about carbon chemistry, organic chemistry. You know, all of the animations, for example, had to reflect um, to the greatest degree possible what actually happens at the molecular level. So there was a lot of that kind of work. Um, but, I mean, this is, you asked me from a scientist, this is going to be really embarrassing. But, you know, we're, we're filming on Vancouver Island in these incredible temperate rainforests, and um, that's when I realized. So I'd always, I'd grown up thinking forests are, are full of solid trees, they're solid environments, and so that solidity comes up from the, from the earth, naturally. And, and then I realized, no, through photosynthesis, it's carbon that is sucked from the atmosphere and fixed into carbon-carbon bonds that become the sugars, that become the lignans, that become the trees. So, the, so these, these solid trees are made of air. And I don't know, I, I guess that's one of those things that just never connected for me in my head. Uh, but you know, you, you could say trees are cathedrals of carbon, but you know, what does that mean? Well, they're literally made from air. <laughs> Is anybody else surprised? Yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that either. Um, any other questions? Okay, this fireside chat here. Um, I wanted to ask you about the animation because I find it's so effective. It, it, they've done a, a 
such a wonderful job, and especially about how, how you chose, I mean, I guess the circle of carbon, but yeah, what? How the did you the do personality, that? the hero yeah, character? Yeah. yeah. Well, because first of all, um, kudos to our team in, in Vancouver, Global Mechanic and Bruce Alcock, the animator. I, I really just think they're incredibly creative. Um, we came to them with a pretty difficult brief. Uh, there's a lot of animation. There's, there's over 280 animation sequences in this film. It's just it's just wall to wall. Um, but carbon in the international chemistry um, classification is black, and we thought, well, you know, we're going to have to break that rule. All the other elements are the, are the right color, but not carbon. And and so we 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 took a leap and said she's got to be magenta. She's got to be a pink. You know, she's got to jump out. She couldn't the, be black. No, she couldn't be black. We decided that. Uh, but then you know the the job of taking us through all of these scales from the atomic to the molecular to the human to the cosmo cosmic, and to push us back and forth between those scales seamlessly. I mean, I think that was the the central challenge and achievement of the animators. Uh, and. They did it. I, they also did it with such a sort of whimsical, beautiful, dynamic style, which I really loved. There's a there's kind of a, a spacey, science fictiony aesthetic to science animation you often see in television and on Discovery. And we we, we, we said we, we want to completely turn our backs on that. We want this to, to feel painterly, and that was that was the start of the brief that we gave them. And they just went with it. And um, and the the hero character Carbon. That's a composite of drawn elements and things that we filmed. So we went in, the first thing we did is we went into a studio and filmed a whole bunch of crap at a thousand frames a second. Explosions, flames, paint exploding, charcoal on a drum, all kinds of stuff, but in super slow motion. And then they built a lot of those effects into the Big Bang or the, the cosmos or, or that character. Um, when you see the Big Bang, half of it is just a a, a paint spinner spinning at high speed with flicks of paint going out. Yeah, so so a lot went into the animation. It's very very rich uh, animated palette. Very rich, and I think magenta was a good color because it really stands out. Um, I just I just find that the solutions are so simple, and I think that's what partly what makes this film so important. And so I think we all should talk about it a lot and get everybody out to see it, yeah. Yep, thanks Joni, and thank you for having us here at this wonderful festival, and thank you for making it through the car rally uh, yes. to get here, really appreciate that. Um, it's, it, it's a beautiful day out there, and there's a huge car rally, so I think anyone in this theater has achieved something important. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Thanks so much for coming.